Okay, well, I guess we'll get started. Welcome. My name is Rowan Thompson. I'm an assistant dean uh, in Carleton's Faculty of Science, focusing on equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I'm also a professor in Canada Research Chair in Physics. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which Carleton University is located is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. So welcome to our second event in our new series, ACE EDI, Awareness, Collaboration and Engagement to Advance Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. We are thrilled to welcome the speaker for this event, Dr. Imogen Ko. Dr. Ko is an extraordinary scientist she is a professor of chemistry and biology at Ryerson University and an affiliate scientist at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. And her research group does uh, research on drug transport proteins. She's also president of the Canadian Molecular Biosciences Society. But Dr. Coe is an example to us all. The great scientists not only do great research, but they also take action to make science a better place for everyone. She's an award-winning activist and advocate with respect to the integration of principles of inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility into research cultures, particularly in science and medicine. Last Wednesday, the 25th of November, marked the start of the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. Within the university and the scientific context, this activism can take many forms. Today, we will learn from Dr. Ko's extensive experiences as she speaks on uncomfortable truths and inclusive excellence in academic science, building the toolkit for change. So thank you very much for coming. I would ask that any questions be typed into the Q&A box and we will try to get to them uh, in turn as many as we have time for at the end. And Dr. Ko, I now invite you to present. Thank you very much. It's uh, delighted. It's delightful to, to to be with you in Zoom world. Um, and uh, one day we will be together in the real world as well. So let me see if I can share my screen. Okay. So Jesse, uh, you might need to enable she, uh, screen sharing. I'm getting a message that it's been disabled. Uh, Okay, there we go. Okay, so let me just uh, make sure I can do this. And I'm going to add closed captioning because it helps with accessibility. So thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna talk about uncomfortable truths, inclusive excellence, and I hope there's some useful tips, tools, and strategies here. As you can see, um, thank you very much to Rowan for that lovely introduction. I'm a mad crazy um, social media fan, and so you can stalk me on the interwebs of these, uh, these sites here, and I welcome engagement on all sorts of topics. I also like to acknowledge where I do my work and where I'm grateful to be uh, living these days. I'm a proud immigrant, I'm a settler. I recognize the enormous privilege that comes with um, being a settler and being a white person in this particular part of the world. Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement Territory. That's a sacred treaty between the Anishinaabek, Mississaugas and Haudenosaunee peoples holds the treaty peoples, the new, not so new, to a spirit of respect for the land and its resources for sharing and, and peace. And these are really good foundational principles for us all to be uh, keeping in mind when we're thinking about things like equity, diversity. We are a collective and we must uh, engage and act as a collective for the support of everybody. I have trips around the Western Hemisphere a little bit um, as an international graduate student. I've done the traditional things that an academic scientist um, does. Um, as Ron mentioned, I have a research group that works on um, membrane transport proteins. They are drug transporters. They're responsible for the uptake of uh, anti-cancer and antiviral drugs. And I've done the things <laughs> that you're expected to do as a research scientist quite successfully externally uh, funded research program, publications, etc. And I put this in here because there's still a little bit of a, a sense out there that people that go into or people that do advocacy or science outreach or science communication or science policy work are somehow 
not quite good scientists, or they're somehow moving in that direction because they're failed scientists. And I've even faced this myself going into academic leadership positions. It's because I couldn't kind of cut it as a scientist. And I really want to challenge that uh, stereotype head on. You can be a very effective, very successful, very accomplished scientist, and you can also advocate for better science across the board, more uh, scientifically informed policy, more scientifically engaged communities. In Parallel with my scientific career, I have for decades, since as for as long as I can remember, been very aware that not everybody else has had as much privilege to pursue a passion around science as I have been able to. Noting that I have faced discrimination and sexism in science, but still have uh, an abundance of privilege, which has allowed me to pursue things that, that have not been possible for other people. And so I have acquired expertise on inclusion, diversity, equity and accessibility, which is a term that you might hear more of going forward because it really brings in the accessibility issues. I have a lived experience and I have a deep academic understanding of these issues and have written and spoken on these issues deeply. So I am a, a practicing academic scientist and I also have an expertise in these other areas. And these things are possible and uh, not um, mutually exclusive. And over the years, I've worked with many organizations, given talks to many different groups, many different types of groups. Um, and importantly, I think it's worth noting that I've had input into policy development, policy making with tri councils, with foundations, and have tried to uh, advise and help other organizations seeking to infuse their cultures with uh, stronger equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility principles. As was mentioned earlier, we're in the middle of the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. And I really want to start by making you feel uncomfortable um, by, by putting it right out in front that science, medicine, engineering are places where sexual harassment, where gender-based violence happens. And we really need to be aware of that. So while we might think this 16 days of activism is something else that's going on that's relevant to other parts of the campus or other parts of the community, I want us to really bring this home and say, you know what, we have these issues in science, engineering, medicine. We know we have these issues and we've got to face up to them. and We've got to start getting uncomfortable and start dealing with them. So we have gender-based violence, which includes sexual harassment in the workplace. That can run from inappropriate language and jokes to physical attack, attacks and coercion into unwanted behaviors. We know because we can measure these things that the rates of sexual harassment in these disciplines is very high. And based on a very substantive American survey, these rates are reported at second only to the military. Over 50%, 58% of women report some form of sexual harassment. I realize that this might be quite triggering, this, this discussion for some people. So this is just a reminder that there be uh, self-care, that if you're feeling uncomfortable, take a step back, breathe, and I want everyone to know that my, uh, I'm available to talk, to listen, to hear um, if you want to tell your story, which I find often happens after I give these kinds of talks. So take care of yourself, reach out if you find that this is raising uh, memories or um, issues that you thought have been put away. I recognize that this can be quite a painful topic to discuss or hear about. This survey that I just mentioned, which I recommend everybody read, uh, came out a couple of years ago. It was put together, uh, commissioned by the National Academies. So this is not a trivial um, little piece of social sciences research that often gets dismissed in, in the physical sciences or the life sciences. This is real substantive data and analysis that the US uh, organizations, National Academies wanted to find out what was going on so they could address these things. And I strongly recommend read the, reading the report because it gives information and it gives suggestions and it really maps out what the situation is. And we might say, oh, you know, but that's, that's in, in the US. But the reality is that these kinds of behaviors that are described are uh, common across the board. And we're talking about science, evaluating science. So this is language that was generated by and for STEM professionals, science, technology, engineering, and medicine. 
There are three categories that they define in this report for sexually harassing behavior, gender harassment, verbal, non-verbal non behaviors that convey hostility or exclusion, unwanted sexual attention and sexual coercion. So harassing behaviors can be either direct or they can be ambient. And particularly when you have a culture that is not infused with equity, diversity, inclusion and accessibility, you can have cultures where these behaviors are very much normalized. And those are very exclusionary, uh, difficult kinds of cultures for people to do their best work, to be able to contribute everything that they can. People think, oh, that's the US and we don't have those issues. I've actually heard a, a chair of a department say we, that's an American thing. We don't have a problem here in Canada. And I want to put this right out in front and be really direct about this. We have a long history of misogyny in science in Canada. And we in Canada have one of the most, if not the most, uh, heinous acts of gender-based violence against women in science, in, in engineering, in the world. So that is not something to be proud of. Uh, 30 years ago, the Montreal um, shooting uh, led to the deaths of these women on the basis of their gender and the fact that they were in engineering. So let's be really clear and honest about the fact that we have issues in Canada that we must address. And we have a long history um, of other issues that we want to look at. 30 years ago, yes, for sure, that's a long time ago, but even as recently as a few years ago, uh, we're still seeing um, hostile responses to the commemoration of this event. Here is Lassonde at York University dealing with vandalism to artwork that was uh, um, commissioned in, co in commemoration of the Montreal massacre. And just last year, we're still seeing misogynistic slurs. We're still seeing challenges to people really understanding that this was an act against women in STEM. And let's call it what it is, a crime against feminism, a crime against equality, a, a crime against uh, women occupying spaces in disciplines where they were traditionally excluded. So yes, that's uncomfortable, but we're gonna have to get into those uncomfortable areas to start really asking questions and finding solutions to um, some of the challenges that are there. We don't have this kind of report in Canada, this kind of National Academy scale of report, but we have a ton of anecdotal data. We have some studies being done by some groups across the country. Uh, the Women in Science and Engineering Chairs, for instance, have done some research both in the prairies and in the uh, Atlantic provinces. And we have significant amounts of anecdotal data, anecdotal evidence, not data, um, that tell us that conferences, scientific conferences can be high risk places that particularly if there's alcohol involved, for instance, at poster sessions, lab work, I can, um, I've been made aware of incidents of um, unwanted behavior um, in dark rooms, microscope rooms, those kinds of, you know, late, late, late nights at work, um, after hours, uh, areas that are unsupervised. Field work has a long history of abusive kind of harassing behavior. Um, I've dealt with classes and lectures where homophobic comments have led to people actually getting up and leaving the room, leaving the computer lab, um, graduate work, lateral violence between graduate students, um, postdoctoral research and academic leadership positions where, well, you know, you can't do that because uh, um, somebody's got a family commitment or whatever. I actually had somebody tell me one time that I'd be great in an academic leadership position, but not right now because you have small children. Um, that's not somebody else's call. That's either you're good for the job or you're good at the job or you're not good at the job. So we have a lot of evidence to suggest that we have some of these issues, all of these issues in Canada, and we need to start being upfront and honest about the fact that they're there. We need to do better and we need to be better in our organizational cultures, in our cultures of science, in the ways of doing science. Um, and I think this talk that I gave just in August was perhaps the first talk at the national level around gender-based violence in science in Canada. Um, and I did it for Courage to Act, which is a national initiative to address and prevent gender-based violence at post-secondary institutions, often focusing on um, you know, sort of generic undergraduates or, or other kinds of um, sort of generic issues. This very specifically is about science. 
Um, and so, and you can find it and I recommend his little toolkit. Anytime there's a little toolkit, it's a recommendation of like, there's something you can go and check out. There's something you can go and maybe learn something from. So I think we need to be starting to talk about these things in ways that are honest and direct and transparent. We're really talking about the integration of these principles into organizational structure, creating what I call cultures of care, what I and other people call cultures of care. And I wrote about this um, in the Lancet last year. And this again is a good toolkit. Um, and there's this whole issue actually is a really good um, set of resources and ideas and background and data and information um, about creating more cultures of care, particularly around gender equity and gender equality. But remember, of course, we're talking about more than gender binary. And it's really important to recognize that we're talking about humanity. We're talking about the rich uh, diversity of, of humanity and all of the different ways that we understand people can be. And so we know that barriers, bias, prejudice, stereotypes exist about all sorts of people, people of color, people with disabilities, members of the LGBTQ2S plus communities, First Nations, older people. And here are some examples. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Mahadeo Sukai, who literally wrote the book on creating a culture of accessibility into the sciences. There's the book, literally, he wrote the book. Um, and I recommend, I should have had a little toolkit there, I recommend getting that book and reading that book because how can we ensure that people with incredibly um, novel, interesting ideas and particularly people um, who have a lived experience of um, disability um, can contribute to, for instance, the development of devices, of mobility devices or, or assistive technology, assistive technology um, to allow people to contribute in society. Stephen Hawking here would probably never have been recognized for his intellect. What had he arrived at Cambridge in a wheelchair? He arrived as an able-bodied person, was able to contribute and then ultimately continue to contribute with all of this assistive technology. So we make judgments about people. We, we have stereotyped about what people with disabilities can do and we're missing an enormous amount of intellectual talent people with disabilities, the most un underemployed um, demographic in Canada of the, of the four um, demographics under employment equity law. So there's a lot of talent that we're missing. Similarly, a lot of people who cannot bring their full selves and do their best work, and this is my friend and colleague, Anthony Bonato, who is a mathematician at Ryerson University, a very accomplished um, senior um, career mathematician who, sent out this tweet a few years ago in response to the gender summit, which was held in Montreal a few years back, um, which both broke my heart and made me realize I had to work harder. So, and, and what he said is as a gay mathematician, I was always on the outside. I never had role models or advocates in my career. And because I had set as a guiding principle and as a priority for the faculty of science um, for which I was the founding Dean, um, he felt like he had an ally. He felt like he had somebody who saw him and was there to advocate and support him. So you don't have to be a member of the community to be active. You can be, and you must be, if you have privilege, an advocate and an ally. And, and we have all sorts of um, other areas that we discriminate against. And just a reminder here that uh, Mahadeo and I and another author have a paper coming out in FACEPS next year about creating inclusive conferences to make sure that everybody has access to, to um, opportunities to present or attend. So we have this myth in Canada that we are very meritorious in Canadian post-secondary education system. We are not, and here is something that everybody should read, the equity myth written by Canadian academics about racialization and indigeneity in universities, Melinda Smith and Howard Ramos. But Melinda Smith is um, quite excellent. I highly recommend her as a speaker. And uh, she is um, one of the authors of this book. Um, the myth of meritocracy protects those with power and privilege. People who are in positions with power established, the status quo, don't want to be pushed out of that because maybe, uh, you know, they have be reached that position because it's not absolutely meritorious. When you're accustomed to privilege and equality, accustomed to privilege, equality and equity feel like oppression. Um, and so we need to be aware of that and we need to recognize uh, that, first of all, the system is not equitable and that people will resist change. Um, 
I don't normally include this little cartoon of the people on the boxes, but I did here in this, just because I want to make it clear that there are still some ideas that um, are out there that somehow um, people who need to, uh, people who cannot um, uh, advance because of barriers somehow has, have some kind of deficit or some kind of, um, uh, they're lacking some kind of ability. So many of you will have seen this cartoon. Usually you see the, the, the first uh, one or two. Um, this is treating people equally. You'll give them all the same box. This is treating people equitably, giving them what they need. The reality is we should really start here. And all of these three people should be the same height, not one of them being shorter and medium height and taller, because that's a deficit model. The reality is some people start off with tremendous privilege. If you are white, straight, middle-class male, you have huge advantages in life. If you are a white woman, you have significant advantages in life and you have privilege. Um, there are other people who start off with significant challenges right from the moment they arrive in the world. And we are seeking a, a situation where those barriers and those um, inequities are, are barriers are removed and the inequities are, are leveled. Um, the problem with this model is that this cartoon is that this is a these people are different heights and using height as a metaphor for oppression can lead to deficit-based interpretations and I've seen this in for instance in CERC EDI um, uh, sections for the HQP which says you know I'm going to help people aspire I'm going to help people from this community aspire to achieve because you know it's because they're not trying hard enough well no, we don't tell people who use wheelchairs to try harder to get up those steps. We recognize that the steps are a barrier. We take them out and we put in a ramp. OK, so be very careful about some of these deficit models. And we know that the structural racism, the structural sexism, that barriers are real. We can measure them. We're scientists. We can study them. Um, and we know that they have serious outcomes. So again, a lot of work out of the US. Um, and we know that we can even build in those biases into our algorithms because that's actually bad science. So the bias gets built into the decision making structures and the databases are skewed because they haven't got diversity built into them. Artificial intelligence, machine learning is not neutral and that's because the science has not been done as well, as rigorously as it could, could be. Um, and so when we're talking about integrating EDI or idea into systems, into cultures, we're actually talking about raising the bar. We're talking about raising the standard, not, you know, trading off diversity for excellence. Actually, no, we're actually going to be better. We're going to get better outcomes because we're going to be more aware and intentional. And again, I hear a lot, oh, that's the US, but it's not. It's Canada. It's Canada. There is racism. There is sexism in Canada and it is structural and it is embedded in our systems. Universities are built on a medieval Eurocentric model that was built for rich white men, not even poor white men. It was built for rich white men um, that hundreds, of, you know, hundreds of years ago, a thousand years ago. Um, that's the model we're using in, in uh, Canada for our post-secondary sector. Why do we use a Eurocentric uh, medieval model? Is that really the best we can do? I don't think so. Um, and we have it structurally racism built into our system. So here's an example of uh, when black medical students um, were ba banned. They were prevented from attending Queen's Medical School. They were actually going to Queen's Medical School. It was quite progressive at the turn of the, turn of the last century. Um, and then post second, post First World War, um, a ban was enacted. They had to leave. They either weren't, couldn't attend or those that were already there had to leave. This only really came to light a few years ago, thanks to Ed Thomas. And um, the ban was only officially repealed a couple of years ago. So structurally into the systems was that racism built. And now Queen's is actually teaching med, med students about this, this ban so that they understand structural racism. They understand how structural racism can impact uh, healthcare and medical outputs. And we're being more um, transparent about the fact that there is sexism and other issues going on in other places at the university. I'm not picking on you have Manitoba or Queen's specifically. There is something happening at every university in this country, every university and every college. 
So inclusive excellence derives from cultures of care that enable and encourage people to bring their full selves to the workplace and do their best work. And if you are a leader, you could be a chair, a dean, you could be leading a research group, you could be a PI, you could be a TA leading a lab section. Um, you have the ability to demonstrate inclusive leadership and inclusive leadership then helps to generate inclusive excellence. And those of power and privilege have a responsibility to do the most work. And usually that means the dominant demographic, which usually means, not always, but usually means white men. It also, inclusive excellence also means doing better science. So in our setting, in our structure that we have here in Canada, researchers must understand the importance of sex and gender plus based um, analysis in experimental design. That means doing the best science or medical research you can do. And researchers should have and demonstrate core competencies in the integration of these principles into their research teams. And that means being the best scientist, researcher, clinician, mentor, teacher, professional colleague you can be. So we're talking about being better, being the best that you can be, learning how to do those things. And if you're not include, not embedding these principles, you're almost certainly entrenching mediocrity. That is a given. If you don't fully understand that, or perhaps you don't even believe that, then here are some resources to go look into. Uh, Londa Scheibinger at Stanford University is a world leader in gendered innovations. She has case studies on um, how failure to integrate and embed equity, diversity, particularly diversity into experimental design has led to failures in terms of full understanding of, for instance, osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is severely underreported in men because the design structure of the science has not been inclusive. Um, we know that genomics is failing on diversity, the databases are skewed. We're not, not getting the full um, benefit of that kind of research. And that's important, particularly in a publicly funded healthcare system where we wanna use all of that information to inform, for instance, our clinical care. And here's another example of, of some uh, reading that you can do, data bias and well design um, for men visible women. Lots of examples in here of where failure to be inclusive about the experimental design has led to poor outputs, it costs money. It's bad for industry. It's bad for economic development. It leads to all sorts of failures or degraded outputs in all sorts of areas. So being inclusive and thinking about these things leads to better outputs. It raises the standard. How do you do this? How do you infuse a culture um, with these principles? How do you get human beings to buy into these things? And as scientists, we always say, oh, more education. We'll just give them more information, more education. Well, that's important. You do need to be educated, but more in education doesn't actually shift human behaviors to the extent that we would like it to, or we think it does as scientists. And here's another great thing that you can watch, a little video there, from a sociologist or a behavioral psychologist. Um, behavioral economists are really good at um, giving us information about how humans behave. And the things that we need to do is set behavioral expectations, attitudes follow. Um, human beings are motivated by loss, works very well for academics, particularly research faculty. You want your research grant, then you need to be doing things the way we're asking you to do them. And you shift social norms. People want to fit in, humans want to fit in. So if everybody's doing something, likelihood is that hmm, people will come along, even if they're a little reluctant or a little hesitant, eh, they'll kind of come along. What does this mean? Realize there's a lot of text on this slide, but I'm just putting out all sorts of ideas so that you can pick and choose what works for you. So first of all, name, name it, understand the lexicon, understand the vocabulary of EDI. Ask questions, how do you feel? Do you feel respected in your workplace? Do you feel like there are barriers to engagement in research culture? Um, get uncomfortable. Has there been harassment in your research environment or your post-secondary environment? Call it out, learn how to do that. Canadians are very uncomfortable with being impolite. We want to be polite, but learn how to have difficult conversations. Learn how to deal with those sexist and racist jokes. Demand better, expect accountability. Have Look at your institutional policies. What's HR doing? Have key performance indicators. Certainly celebrate, it's not all negative, celebrate um, things like Ada Lovelace Day. There's been recently, just last week, a couple of weeks ago, LGBT, Q in STEM day, um, all sorts of opportunities to celebrate. 
communicate, share best practices. Social media has been a great place to find like-minded people who can support and build networks um, of best practice, that kind of thing, build communities. Copycats, model the behavior that you seek, particularly if you are a leader, particularly if you are a man, I would say it's really important to model the behavior, look to role models, mentors are good, but please use evidence-based approaches. Sponsorship is really important. If I could see every senior male scientist in this country um, nominate a whole slew of junior diverse uh, candidates for um, awards, I think that would be a real achievement. And expect to prepare for pushback. This is not all rainbows and dolphins and unicorns. This is actually very hostile to some people. There will be defensiveness and learn to handle it. And we're all in this. I don't want to hear again somebody saying, oh, but you know, really, if we teach it in kindergarten, no, no, we're not putting it on three-year-olds. We are taking responsibility for this. It's on all of us. Resource allocation, I have to say the Tri-Councils have done a good job in terms of incentivizing behavior. If you don't know how to write the EDI section in your HQP part of your NSERC discovery grant, then learn because it's mandatory. It's going to be there. And if you don't have it, you're going to lose points. Is it insufficient? I don't know, but probably ne next year it might be insufficient. So, um, and it's very real. And trust me, I'm the chair of EG1501. So I've seen this in practice now and it's getting more rigorous. Um, CIHR is the same. You must have that sex and gender based analysis in your experimental design. And I just saw some data recently from CIHR saying that if that's done really well, those grants seem to be more likely to be successful. So in a very tight funding climate, then this could be very useful. Uh, if they don't do it, lose money. And if you don't know how to do it, find out, learn, have workshops. And just, you know, it may not be from your, or your office of research services or your HR people. They're working very hard to help, but sometimes it's the equity and science experts who can actually do some of the best training. Leadership matters and please model EDI infused behavior. Use pronouns, just share them. It's really not that difficult. Uh, I have a footer email as a commitment to um, license land acknowledgement. It's also, there's also a commitment to uh, respecting work hours. Um, support events um, have posters that specify safe places. We're actually doing that. I had a request from somebody in physics um, at Ryerson, a man who's running a, a lab and he wants some posters to say this is a welcoming environment for LGBTQ members. Um, please change the walls of the old white guy photos. Pretty much every institution, every science faculty in the country has these walls of old white guy photos. You don't have to take them all down, but maybe intersperse them with some diversity and support inclusive events. Have expectations. As the Dean, I asked to see um, speaker, speaker lists for seminar series when people would come and say, can you give me some money for a conference? Um, I'd also say you have to have a conference code of conduct. That's absolute must have. Um, that was hard to, to get across in Canada for a while. They've been a standard in the US for a long time, but um, we're now seeing most conferences in Canada that I'm aware of now have a conference code of conduct. Um, and just expectations, set the expectations, set the expectations around hiring, which might be difficult depending on your collective agreement. So that's very um, uh, context specific. And for trainees, I really think is an opportunity to help trainees, PDS graduate students and undergraduates really upskill, really learn how to write those diversity statements that are required now in many hiring situations. Be able to explain what inclusive design looks like so that if you're teaching to a class like we had in Toronto, incredibly diverse, 70% racialized from historically excluded kinds of communities, understand, be able to explain to me as somebody who's hiring you how you're going to do that when there's 45 languages in the class and 60% and of the class have English as a, as a second or other language. Um, I want inclusive design. I want to know how you're going to do that knowledge translation in a way that actually includes everybody. Um, bystander training can be very useful for um, how do you deal with that sexist joke that your lab mate just had to, had to put up with? Bystander training, very useful. Um, and allyship training can be very useful. And this is just a series of posters that were put together by our undergraduate um, uh, community, Science Plus, which is an undergraduate society um, aimed at supporting all kinds of communities. Um, they generated these posters 
um, themselves with the help of uh, the Office of Sexual Violence on campus. And um, just to uh, share and put in different places around campus in, in, in science to um, show that there was support and that um, just to sort of try and infuse the culture and the environment with some, um, some EDI principles. And there are lots of resources out there. So this is just something that came out recently um, as a, you know, in Science or Nature. Um, it's not hard to find out what needs to be done. Sometimes you will have to do the work though yourself and not expect other people to do it for you. Any EDI infusion is gonna be context dependent. It's gonna depend on what you have, what your culture is, what your organization looks like. Um, and you know that best, or you must set out to find that, find out what that is. Uh, find out who the champions are, who the allies are. Institutional resources can be useful. Some universities are very good. Some universities are very bad. Equity experts are always helpful. They may not be in science, but they're still experts. This is not, you know, this is not something you can do as a sort of a, an amateur. You need help with training. You need help with the, with the background. And it is not the role of the historically excluded otherwise sometimes called the underrepresented, but I think we're now seeing the language of historically excluded. It's not the role of historically excluded faculty or graduate students or undergraduates or trainees to do this work. It is the role of the people with power and privilege. I am white, I have huge privilege. I, am, um, I, I have a British accent, which also puts me in a certain category, gives people make judgments about me, puts me in a socioeconomic category, um, people make judgments about my background, which are often wrong, um, but I have privilege. I have tenure, which is an enormous privilege. Um, so, which means I have responsibility. It's not to say I haven't had challenges in my life. I was a single parent. I dealt with sexism in, in the academy, um, but I have significant privilege. And so I have responsibility to do what I can. And you can do what you can in a place that's safe for you because not everybody can do that. Um, Self-awareness is really, important. This EDI work is hard work. It's hard work if it's going to be done effectively and with impact. I see a lot of EDI committees in different institutions, departments, whatever, and they're often made up of women, uh, you know, the one or two members from a marginalized community that happen to be in the, in the department. Um, they're often very passionate about the issue, um, and they often have very little power, very little ability to actually get anything done. Um, EDI work is hard work, it needs to be done by everybody, it needs to be um, supported and led by leadership, so that means chairs, deans, uh, presidents, um, and it's really their role to provide the resources and to recognize that the EDI work is hard work and it needs to be rewarded accordingly. So if you are active um, and contributing and impactful in this area, that is significant and needs to be recognized in the academy as merit, as meritorious, and be rewarded. Again, when you're accustomed to privilege, equity or equality can feel like oppression. There is pushback, experience it all the time. That is, you know, I, I'm grateful for, for tenure because um, I'm not, I don't have to worry about losing my job because I say some things I do, but that's not the case for everybody. Um, but certainly people, organizations and institutions will push back and we must expect it. We shouldn't be surprised by that, um, but we can be strategic and we can really need to, we need to move out of our Canadian politeness, which I think is sometimes passive aggressive and can be conflict avoidant. We can use our privilege to affect change and we can embrace that discomfort. Discomfort can be good. It can lead to more innovation. If you've had a loud group like I have, um, many of you may have been in, in situations where there have been people from all over the world or people from very different backgrounds or people who have different languages. Um, that can be a challenge to actually communicate. But what studies show, and this is some of the work that Sarah Kaplan at Rotman has done, brilliant work, is that diverse teams have to present ideas more clearly. They have to clarify concepts. Sometimes it's iterative, it's, it's more thorough, and actually you get better outputs. You have to practice it, you have to embrace it, but the outputs you get can actually be more effective, more impactful. You get better innovation that can lead to, um, you know, better products or processes, more money, that kind of thing. So, the, you know, the, this idea that discomfort is something we want to avoid, well, actually, no. Maybe we want to sit in our discomfort and sit with some of those uncomfortable truths for a bit and then 
move forward and work on embracing the principles so that we can have better outputs. I just want to finish with this one um, quote that uh, came to me from um, a colleague last year. And uh, this is a young colleague. He was a postdoc at the time. Come, he is an immigrant, comes from a country, um, a young gay man. He was not out as a young gay man in, initially in his, uh, in his community where he came from, nor going through his undergraduate degree. Um, and he was, he it was exhausting. He, was, he described, I was on a panel with him and he described how exhausting it was um, to continually have to edit himself, even when he moved to Canada, um, much more embracing, much more welcoming environment, uh, still not out to the lab he was in. And he would talk about uh, having to edit himself on a Monday morning when everybody came back from the weekend and they were describing what they did. Maybe they went to the movie with a boyfriend or girlfriend and he would edit himself continually, worrying about what he was going to say. And by Wednesday, he was exhausted. He could not continue to do that. It was taking such a toll on his mental health and his productivity. He could not bring his full self and do his best work. It had taken a toll on his mental health. Earlier in his life, he had been um, engaged in self-harm. Eventually he came out to his lab, very supportive lab, could finally be his full self. And he told the story and I um, was, it was very compelling. The room was, was totally engaged. Um, and I recommended him to go and be part of this LGBTQ and STEM conference at Windsor, University of Windsor, kudos to them to be the first institution to run this conference in Canada. It's been going on in the UK and the US for a while. Um, and he went and there were other members of the community from math and from life sciences. He's in pharmaceutical sciences. And he, uh, he sent me this email afterwards and he said, I have never felt more at home in a room full of strangers, to be honest. It was a truly great experience. And again, it broke my heart. Um, but I was really happy for him because he is finally being able to be his full self. Um, but we should never, ever have environments or cultures or science, post-secondary systems or sectors or industries where people do not feel at home um, and feel more at home in a room full of strangers. So we need to really change this. We really need to infuse our cultures and create cultures of care that allow people to bring their full selves and do their best work. Remember that we are raising the bar so that people like my friend here can do his best work fully for all of the time he's in the lab. He can contribute, he can make discoveries, he can do the things that he's really talented at and we can all benefit as a result. Thank you very much. I hope there's some time for some questions and I really appreciate your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Imogen. That was wonderful. Um, very inspiring. And uh, there have been many comments um, and we have many attendees too. So let's head over to the questions. So thank you very much. Um, so from Kim Roberts, Rates of sexual harassment, military, academia. Do you know about police service rates? I've come across a lot of this. Police service rates? Yes, so in the police. Um, that I don't know, no. I'm sure there are data out there, um, but the data I know are specific for the disciplines in science and medicine and engineering, so. Um, okay. Thank you. And the, the same person has a question. I find that sometimes women themselves put themselves down, presumably that so that they can fit in with the men. Have you any comments or suggestions for them? Yeah, so I mean, I could do a whole, you know, weekend workshop, <coughs> workshop on gender stereotyping and the way women are engendered to behave in ways that um, support patriarchy, um, minimize um, their own presence, minimize their own, you know, even taking up space. So yeah, absolutely, that is an issue and that we sometimes we have to unlearn some of the behaviors that we've been taught all our lives and um, learn other behaviors and we have to have other people learn that actually you know, how a woman behaves um, can have a much broader range of characteristics. So calling somebody bossy or abrasive or um, opinionated or outspoken is my favorite, you know, um, because they express an opinion. So yes, unlearning behaviors and gender stereotyping, both for men and women, it disenfranchises. It, 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 it's not fair to men or women. The next question is, are we able to download the presentation so we can follow the links? 
<laughs> yes. So what I'm going to do is send a PDF version of the slides to um, Rowan, I guess, and it can be shared for your personal use. This is my intellectual property. So I put a lot of work into putting these together. Um, so you will have all the resources, you will have all of the links, um, you won't, they won't be clickable links, but it, you'll have all of the information and you can, um, you know, you can pick and choose what you want to go look at. Yeah, so we'll, we'll come up with a way in the Faculty of Science office uh, to share this according to Dr. Crow's wishes. Um, another question, in this era of online instruction, closed captioning recorded and live lectures is highly encouraged. What software did you use for that purpose in this talk? Good question, excellent question. Um, I am, you. so I upload my PowerPoint to my Google Drive and then I, sh I present out of Google Drive um, out of Google Slides, and the captioning is an option that you can then turn on. So I believe the most recent version of PowerPoint also does the same thing. Um, and there are a number of other options as well. The best um, software is called otter.ai, otter as in the little animal. Um, and that is what's been recommended to me by experts like Mahadeo Sukai. So we, we also have a, a, that paper coming out soon about inclusive conferences, which will have some of those links. So there are a number of options and everybody should be doing it. And That's ASL good. as well, if possible, yes. Uh, expanding DEI or IDE or EDI to include accessibility. So your idea seems like a good idea. What's the rationale for shortening STEM to SEM, S-E-M? So that's a lot of, there's a lot of culture behind that. So if you go to the UK or Australia, you'll see STEM with an extra M. It's science, technology, engineering, math, and medicine. Um, the national academies are science, engineering, and medicine. STEM as a term has its own history and culture. And it, it was sort of generated and then adopted. It's actually not a very good acronym, um, but it's one that people use. So it depends on where you are, a little bit about your national culture and history um, and what people are familiar with. So I try to make sure people understand the, you know, the, the acronyms. Great. Uh, there's a question about disabilities and access. Uh, field courses occupy a tenuous space. Uh, there's a mandate for equal access, but field settings are, settings are often difficult. For example, students requiring mobility assisting devices. If a quadriplegic student enrolled in a field course, say one involving boats or water or hiking or scuba diving, who is responsible for providing access and accommodations? The host department, the field station, the home university, the instructor, or the student who covers the potential costs? So very practical question. Well, that's gonna depend on your institution. So different institutions handle that quite differently. But if, if you're in, like there's only three provinces in Canada that have, um, you know, an act, legislation around access, Ontario being one of them, so the AODA. So there would be a requirement on the institution to, to ensure that there is accommodation or that there is access or that there is some um, equitable alternative. Um, and there should be support for uh, faculty or staff who are developing these kinds of courses. So I think if we had a broader range of options for field courses um, and a broader, a broader understanding of, of how to accommodate, um, then there would be a lot more possibilities. So it, it, you know, again, creating, go read the book, creating culture of accessibility in the sciences. There's a lot more that we can do um, if we are intentional. Another question comes up about designing a course. So this person asks, I'm in the process of designing a course and I would like to include significant contributions of minorities, women, LGB2S plus scientists, et cetera, especially STEM history, but I have had a hard time finding resources, likely because these scientists are rarely highlighted. Where do you recommend looking for these resources? Um, well, there's a lot of resources out there. It depends what, um, perhaps what discipline you're in. Um, there's 500 women scientists as, a, as an organization. There's a fair number of um, books now for children around that highlight um, members of um, historically excluded communities that have made contributions. Um, there's actually quite a lot of resources out there. It's just it's sometimes you have to search for them. But if you want to send me an email, I can probably start pointing you in a in a direction 
um, that might help um, and start building up a, a library of um, resources. I used to have a website where all of these things were collected um, and some, there might be something there that I can help you with. That's wonderful. We certainly need these resources for teaching. Uh, I've noticed that when even not necessary, science tends to use language that is only accessible to those with the privilege of higher education. This is also in line with the articles only being accessible when paying often extreme amounts of money. Do you think this will ever change? Or do you think there are ways to change this? As a scientist, we're expected to write in such complicated line, language for an article to be submitted to a journal, further excluding those without educational privileges. Yes, yeah, so there's actually some interesting research that says the more complicated the language, the worse science. Um, so, you know, really good science should be communicated in an accessible way to other scientists. So, and I can tell you from reviewing grants, I review grants for two, three of the three, three the tri-councils. Um, the best grants are the ones that are written in plain language that are accessible for um, highly educated, but not necessarily absolutely that that narrow area of research experts. Um, Dr. Stephen Hurd has written a book about how to uh, write science, how to write good science. Um, and there's a lot of evidence now that says that if you want to be an effective science communicator to policymakers, to uh, the general public, then you need to know how to write in accessible ways. That doesn't mean dumbing down, which is something we often hear. It actually is harder to write in an accessible way. Um, but that, so it's like, again, we're raising the standard. Um, learning to write in, a, in an accessible way without jargon, without acronyms, is actually better science writing. So I think that's what we should be focusing on and aiming for, and we should be teaching that way. Um, in terms of open access, absolutely. Like Nature just came out with a thing this week that, you know, to publish, it's gonna be 10,000 euros or 10,000 pounds or something. Absurd, absolutely absurd. But there's a lot of work going on around the world um, towards open access, uh, towards um, different models of open access, how quite how that's gonna work, quite what that's gonna look like varies depending on where you are. But there's a definite recognition that um, these ridiculous paywalled um, bodies of information um, are exclusionary. They're exclusionary to the global south, they're exclusionary to, to marginalized population, they're exclusionary to the public who often have paid for the research because it's tax funded, taxpayer funded research. So I think there's a lot of work being done on that and we're kind of moving in the right direction, just not fast enough. The next question deals with ethnic diversity. So you mentioned ethnic diversity in Toronto. Some universities don't have such diversity in the student population, including smaller schools. Do you have any advice about this? Well, uh, so that so there's always going to be a range of diversity. So you know, if you're coming from a, maybe a more rural location, there could be a lot of socioeconomic diversity. Um, there could be diversity about you know who has a parent that went to post secondary education and who doesn't. There's an enormous amount of, um, you know, the, 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 un, the invisible curriculum. Like, how do you navigate the system? What do you do? How do you apply? How do you, so there's, there's different kinds of characteristics that um, can be invisible, um, but are almost certainly going to be there. And so it's a question of knowing your community, knowing who you're dealing with, knowing them as human beings in all of their rich kind of different ways of, of defining themselves. So absolutely, I agree. There are different parts of the country that have different kinds of demographics. Um, and so it's really a question of getting to know your demographic and then making sure that you, 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 you match to them. The next question is about uh, actions or comments that might be harmful. So how do you answer to people that consider that an action or comment is not harmful or minimize the impact of it because they consider that the intention was not to harm or based on the fact that this person is not macho, racist or homophobe? Um, well, if you make the comment, you don't get to decide what the level of the impact is, right? It's not, you don't get to make that call. It's the person who is impacted who gets to make the call that is, that impacted me, that really bothered me. And it's, it's quite like, it's quite possible that there are some people who can brush things off, maybe your close friends, maybe people who know you really well, uh, if you say something 
offensive. And there are other people for whom it's deeply, deeply impactful, in which case it's deeply, deeply impactful. And you need to recognize that and adjust accordingly. So, um, I, you know, I'll be blunt, like it, it, it's pretty straightforward. Just don't be a jerk. Like, and be self, <laughs> I mean, I know that's not a technical term. It's not very scientific, uh, but it's accessible. Um, be self-aware enough to recognize that what you do does resonate with other people and calibrate accordingly. And, you know, if people are in science and they particularly have made it through, you know, a number of levels, then they should be capable of understanding. That is not an intellectually complex concept to, to take on. So if it impacts somebody, it impacts somebody. It's not your, you don't get to decide that. The next question deals with your own trajectory. Were you always outspoken and doing activist work to this extent? <laughs> Did getting tenure make it easier to be outspoken? Have you ever felt pressure to stay quiet because you feel repercussions to your own career? Yeah, so first of all, I'm not outspoken. <laughs> I am spoken just because I have an opinion on something doesn't mean I'm outspoken. It just means I'm using my voice and I'm saying how I think about things. Um, you know, so uh, have I don't think I've ever been any other way. So I can I can remember when I was seven years old in my little primary school in England, um, little co-ed primary school, and the boys and girls were rounded up and the boy, boys were, you know, corralled and sent off to woodworking. And the girls were crawled and sent off to sewing lessons. I think that's what, what happened anyway. And I can remember thinking, that doesn't make any sense. It's like, why does that happen? And it could have been short and tall, or it could have been people with brown eyes and blue eyes. It just didn't make any sense. Just like, didn't make any sense. And so from the earliest age, I was just like always aware that there were things that the world, the world worked in ways that didn't make sense. Like it made no sense. Why would you do that? Why would you cut possibility and potential in half? Like it just didn't make any sense. So I've always been aware of that and I've always pointed it out. The fact that I would point it out didn't always necessarily align with the way other people thought you should behave. Um, but again, it didn't make sense to me. Um, so I think I have always kind of raised it as an issue. As a woman in science, absolutely, you're gonna raise it as a gender issue. Um, and I've experienced all of those kinds of things about um, you know that, that, that iceberg of, of um, harassment kinds of behaviors. Um, so yes, and some of that would have come from um, pointing things out or talking back or saying something. I've had people say things about me. I'm sure it's lost me potentially roles or jobs. I don't know about jobs, um, but it, people have been uncomfortable. No, we don't want her here. We don't want her in the room. Um, but enough of what I say resonates with other people and seems to be what other people need to have said. So once I got tenure and I started to realize that was a huge privilege, then I thought, well, actually, you know, this is kind of my job. I need to say some of these things. And now I am, you know, I hear the stories of people who will tell me things that are going on in their, in their lives, in their science, people who are leaving science, have left science. I love I loved engineering, but I just was so tired of it. I loved math. I just was so tired of it. A, a tired of always being discriminated against. I think, well, no, I have to say this. I have to say these things and I have to say them loudly, but articulately. So, um, yeah. So if, for tenure, sure, it's easier. It, it's, a, it's a platform with privilege. Wonderful. So we'll try and get to a couple more questions, but we're, we're running out of time. Um, is the rise of nationalism related to pushback against EDI? I don't think they're related to, to, to well, I mean, they may be related. So again, you know, the, those with privilege um, feel like um, equity is oppression. So when you start to say, um, you know, why <laughs> look at politics? Like, is there nobody other than old white guys who can, who can run countries? And are they doing a good job? Are they too emotional? Um, when you start to, to challenge some of those things, those people will push back, yes. And so certainly there's some of that. I've heard that in science. I had somebody tell me a couple of years ago, um, well, if you're a, and it was physics, if you're a woman in physics, um, of course you can get a job. I can't get a job. Young, 
you know, a postdoc level. Um, and I know Rowan has heard these kinds of things as well. So yes, the people who have had all of the advantage and the privilege for hundreds of years, when we start to level the playing fields, suddenly feel like, oh, they're taking stuff away. So I think that's linked into nationalism. I don't think it's, you know, they're not, not directly because I promote EDI you know, the Proud Boys are out there marching. But yes, it's part of a cultural shift. And anytime you get cultural shift, there is disruption. So this is cultural shift. We will have disruption and that's okay. It's part of the process. Okay, so we'll have two last questions. Uh, there are very few black professors to act as role models for our black science students. Do you have suggestions for white faculty or for how white faculty fa faculty can fulfill this important role until our faculty is more diverse. Yeah, that's um, that's a very good question. I think really learning about allyship and remembering that allyship is a verb. And to quote Roxane Gay, um, you know, the black community doesn't want allies; it wants accomplices. It wants people to tear down those structures. So be really careful about performative allyship, which we're very good at in Canada. I don't care whether you post the black square on Tuesday on Instagram for Black Lives Matter. What are you actually doing in your classes? So for instance, using examples of black scientists, are you doing that intentionally? Are you talking about racism in science? Are you inviting speakers? Be really active and proactive to the point where you're pushing yourself out of your comfort zone, I think, and ask the students what they want. That's the other thing is we make assumptions when we have privilege, we make assumptions that we can be benevolent. You know, we have the white savior complex. We can be, I see this a lot with indigenous um, science, you know, engagement. Um, we'll just go in there and we'll, we'll do stuff. And actually, you know, like, did you ask them what they want? So, and that, that can be scary because you're asking them what they want and they might, you might hear some things that are really, shocking that like you're failing at doing. Uh, I know that's certainly I fail at all time. I'm still continually trying to learn how to do better. Um, but those are some ideas that maybe are possible. Wonderful. And the last question uh, comes from a grad student. So the student says, hello, Dr. Ko, I'm female Asian grad student who has experienced racism from one of my co-supervisors and adjunct prof at Carleton this year during COVID uh, and he tends to be way less polite to me than to other white students. Due to the unequal relationship between grad students and supervisors, it is actually extremely hard for students to stand up for themselves when facing these bias because of gender or race. Could you provide some advice to students specifically about how to protect themselves and how to communicate with their supervisors when facing racism or sexism during graduate studies? Thanks in advance. Yeah, so that's very hard. I'm really sorry to hear that. It takes a lot of courage to speak up. So. Um you know acknowledge that and acknowledge that there must be a, a real burden to be um, dealing with that's not fair it's not right we need to do better I think graduate the graduate student sector is a really really um, vulnerable sector I think we all need to do better for graduate students um, in science in Canada in, in, in general but let's focus on science um, I think uh, it's really incumbent on program directors um, and other committee members to um, to really step up and if you can talk to other parts of your committee or your other supervisor to to um, let them know that this is happening maybe that person shouldn't be your co-supervisor maybe they need to be replaced um, but really it's on grad program directors and it's on leaders in academia to step in and make sure that um, those power dynamics are not being abused because if, I tell you some of the worst stories I have are, are from graduate students around power, abuse of power, lateral violence and that kind of thing. So um, I would recommend that you reach out to somebody you trust, a faculty member and see what's possible within your context. Um, I think every faculty member should be trained in dealing with um, uh, supervision across cultures. Western University has a nice manual for um, supervision across cultures. I can add that to my list of things that I provide you. Um, and graduate students should be um, empowered and trained in terms of how to have difficult conversations. And maybe it needs to be a facilitated conversation that you're having. Maybe you need to have somebody else there to try and address the situation, but you need some people, you need to, some network, you need some people around you to help you manage that. So that's a little bit of suggestion. Um, hopefully somebody 
maybe who is listening in can step in and 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 add some specifics around that. All right, well, with that, Dr. Ko, thank you so much for sharing your experiences um, and your uncomfortable truths and bringing these conversations to us, as well as all the enthusiasm and hope. Um, and we will continue our conversations going forward. And we hope to welcome you at some point in person at Carleton uh, for more of these conversations and actions as we all work together uh, to make science, STEM, SEM, whatever you wanna call it, a more inclusive place. So thanks a lot. And there's been lots of wonderful feedback and thank you to all the attendees. Uh, it's an amazing turnout with more than 100 people. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much, it was wonderful. And yes, I hope we meet in uh, real life one day soon. Yes, thank you. Okay.